Hello, I'm Dan Schinder. And I'm Steven Schinder. And we are doing a very special episode here on Yes Shift, father-son team. Yeah, he's the father, I'm the son. In case you weren't sure. Not that he looks old, but often I can be quite immature. Yeah, I'm 27, and he's somewhere north of that. (laughs) (laughs) Quite a bit. (laughs) Yeah. The music you're hearing is Yes actually playing uh, a song from Alan's um, solo album, um, Ramshackled, which Steve and I actually scheduled this for his birthday like two months ago long before he passed yeah because we if you've been following us you know we did a we're doing an album series a little bit different than yes's album series we're doing the first of each solo album by each member of yes from the time yes yes is joining yes right and we're playing a little bit of song of innocence let's let that play a little bit And for those who don't know, I started to think to myself, I was going to say, it sounds really good as a Yes song. Well, Steve Howe was playing the laptop steel on the yeah, original he, version and John was singing. So Yeah, you got Steve and John on there. Yeah. So beautiful piece of music. Uh, Alan was a beautiful piece of human. Um, I knew him since 1989. And when I started Trump Talk TV in 2013, um, I had him on, I think, I think the first year, actually, and I hadn't seen him in a while. Um, but uh, I don't know. Yeah. Um, it's, it's been a little hard to process, but we wanted to feature this very special solo album, the only one he did. Yeah, and of course, today would have been his 73rd birthday, and we just came from uh you dad just did a tribute to him over on germ talk tv so people can check out that video afterward i'll be sure to link in the comments uh, uh thanks along the way. yeah uh, i played just a half hour or so yeah, um 45 minutes oh okay yeah um, <laughs> yeah that makes sense because i played like the first half of awaken and then the revealing science of god and then um going for the one and right. uh and then on the day before, so May 29th, which happens to be Steve's sister's birthday and my daughter's birthday, same person, um, yeah. <laughs> we did a long memorial tribute to Alan. I had just gotten back from a vacation and I got the text on the last day of that vacation when we were packing to come home that he had passed. So Sunday we did that. Uh, yeah, I remember when... Um... I got the message. Uh, You were trying to call me, but I was on the bus because I was traveling. And so you had to text it to me. And it was like after I was listening to Stevie Nicks and thinking about that interview where Alan talked about, you know, the Love Will Find A Way was almost a Stevie Nicks song. And he convinced Trevor to make a Yes song. Yeah. So it was very bizarre. And I had to like listen to tales like after hearing that news. But yeah, it's been... You know, fans have been showing their tributes and whatnot. Um, I'll actually mention a few right off the bat, and and then we'll go into talking about this album. And at the end, we'll we'll touch upon the set list for Yes's warm up show that they did yesterday. So we'll we'll save that to the end. So and spoil that. And we have something special to show you and play in between. Yeah, and we'd love to see who knows what the actual wink with the because that's the caveat what the actual piece of music is that you're going to be hearing with something i put together for alan but steve go for it give some shout outs to other people giving tributes playing drums to yes music right so in that category we had um and i'll mention a couple other yes members as well but at the nam show Brand X keyboardist Chris Clark uh, apparently like pounded out the intro to hold on in tribute to Alan. And he's looking forward to performing with John Anderson on tour in April of next year. 
A friend of ours, Tony Jefferson, was drumming to Gates of Delirium. Uh, it's really great. And uh, so is Greg Diener's uh, video from last year, which he reshared uh, as a tribute, where he drummed to Owner of a Lonely Heart. And uh, this isn't a drumming one, but I wanted to uh, give then... a shout out to... No, I'm kidding. To, <laughs> to Matt... A bear, um, I think that's how it's pronounced. Spell H E B E R T. I did one of those like Google has this sound like type of things, but yeah, check out his YouTube channel. He's done like a couple guitar things. To, like, Leaves of Green is beautiful. Yeah. Love Every that. Friday. Great job. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, earlier I saw that Jeff Downs tweeted a uh, like Happy Heavenly Birthday thing to Alan. And Oliver Wakeman over on his website wrote, uh, like, like he posted about Alan after hearing the news, but he made a lengthier thing with a few anecdotes, like how Alan was very encouraging to him when he had to learn the yes material in such a short amount of time. And as we know, Alan also had to like learn that in a short amount of time. So what better mentor for that? Yeah, and I also saw that both Oliver and Jeff also tweeted about John Wetton, whose birthday would have been the other day as well. So, yeah. you know, lo lots of stuff to take in. Um, yeah. All these musicians. Um, one of my, um, I guess, one of my favorite singers, Julie Cruz, passed away recently. Right. As well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she, a few of her songs ended up on the show Twin Peaks. So yeah, it's, it's a strange time, but we're, you know, we're going forward by, we keep on listening to these people's music, of course. Yeah. And that's what music's for, you know, to, to live on, you know, and yeah. that's, that's such a great legacy. I mean, the legacy Alan's left behind, um, even had he never played in Yes, what he did with John Lennon, he's on Imagine. He's played with George Harrison, John and Yoko. He played with Joe Cocker. I mean, he's done so many things. Oh, and then there's that Yes thing for about a month <laughs> shy of 50 years. You know, that's that. You know, who holds a job for yeah, that long? Two months, maybe. Yeah. yeah. So uh, there, there's you can really dive in. And, and soak up yeah. a lot of Alan. Yeah, definitely. So um, regarding Ramshackled, uh, this came out, so here's a context for this. Um, and this bit I got from Wikipedia because it was succinct enough and it just makes more sense than me trying to paraphrase it, I guess. but. Um, Alan White had worked with these musicians like before all this Yes stuff. Uh, he worked with Pete Kirtley and Kenny Craddock in the Alan Price set and Happy Magazine. And uh, he, Kirtley, Craddock, and Colin Gibson then worked together in a short-lived band Griffin in 1969, excuse me. And in the early 70s, uh, they, along with Bud Beetle, played together in Simpsons Pure Oxygen. Um, and says here, Craddock was also in the second lineup of Linda's fame, who released two albums between 73 and 75. So some of these people on this album were kind of old friends of Alan. And so... And that's cool that he brought them in, you know. I like that. Yeah. And so... Uh, Apparently, this may have been recorded in two days, if Wikipedia is to be believed. I couldn't find any other place. Wait, but... the whole album? Yeah, I mean, it says on Wikipedia, I so I don't know if it's Oh, well, it's, if it's on the but... internet, it's truth. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, back up. I That's okay. something I never oh. knew. Sasha didn't know either. He's chiming in. Sorry, oh. folks. Two days. I thought it was amazing oh. that... Led Zeppelin's presence was recorded in two weeks with Robert in a leg cast and in a wheelchair most of the time. Right. Two days. That's and, and there's a lot of substance in that music, which when it came out as a drummer, so it came out in 75, right? 
Uh, well, it was recorded in May 1975, but it came out in 76. Um, I saw somewhere that it said March 1976, but listening to the, well, watching the bit of the gr old Grey Whistle Test interview that's out there, unfortunately the Excuse whole thing's me. not out there, but uh, based on the date that that came out and them saying it comes out this Friday, it seems to have come out February 27th, 1976. So I would have just almost turned 13 and, and I had been playing drums six years already. And when it came out, this is kind of embarrassing, but keep in mind, I was 13. Um, I was kind of disappointed because I expected a drum centric album. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I expected something that really like featured him. I had just different expectations. So I never really dug into it. Now that I'm older, and more mature musically and business-wise, and that's about it. Uh, you know, it's of course grown on me, and I appreciate all the different styles, and and it, it really is a good album. And when you listen to it, if you listen to it and remember what Steve said about it being recorded in two days, that's crazy. Well, well again, I couldn't find anything else to corroborate that, so I don't know for sure. Okay. But... Um, but listening to an interview from back then with like Nightbird and company, Alan was saying basically they were just getting together to have fun. And I think that's a really chill way to approach it. And it really feels like this is the least solo out of those Yes Members solo albums. At the oh, time. that's interesting. You're right. The yeah, least could... solo of the solo albums. It's more of a... It's more of a breakaway album. It's more of an album yeah. he didn't do with Yes, though he was instrumental. See what I did there? In, yeah. <laughs> you know, putting it all together and, you know, the, all that stuff. So it's interesting that it is what it is based on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so other things are going on around that time. By the time this album came out, it just in general, music news uh david bowie put out station to station peter mm. frampton put out frampton comes alive what the best live album recording at that time and it still is very good that i remember that not sorry to interrupt but just for context the standard was raised way high when that album came out production wise as as a live album it was light years ahead yeah, and in the world of prog rock, Genesis had put out a trick of the tale. So we had that transition from Gabriel to Collins. And around this time, uh, Rush was about to put out 2112, which, you know, another... Flopped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it did really well. <laughs> <laughs> That's what um, turned them into a cult band to start with. Um, yeah. A lot of groundbreaking stuff now that you mention all that. Peter leaving, Phil taking over, Frampton Comes Alive, the, one of the greatest live albums ever. Even if you don't like the music, you got to acknowledge the playability, the, 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 the musicianship, the production. And then 2112, look what all that turned into. Yeah. You know, and I mean, the other day was the 10th anniversary of Clockwork Angels, the final right. Rush studio album and my favorite Rush album. Is it your favorite? I don't know if I knew that. You'll yeah, probably say you told me eight times, but I, <laughs> but uh, so, it's interesting. Some people didn't receive that album that well. For me, it was the beginning, not Snakes and Arrows, but I think Clock, I think Snakes and Arrows tied up some stuff and Clockwork Angels was a glimpse of what could have been for the next 10 years. Like it was very mature. The sound was different. The lyrics were enchanting. It's a great album. And I love that it's tied in with the book that Neil wrote with the other gentlemen. And um, I like it personally. So interesting, interesting. Yeah, but getting back to 76, compared to those other albums, Ramshackled was pretty low key, you know? Yeah. Like, and it's kind of doesn't have, um, like it's very eclectic, I guess uh, is what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah, 
Well, well, I guess I'll read off the track list real quick. So on side one, we have Ooh Baby, in parentheses, going to pieces, One Way Rag, Avacac, Spring Song of Innocence. And in side two, we have Giddy, Silly Woman, Marching Into a Bottle, Everybody, and Darkness, parts one through three. Um, now, I, I want to uh, comment on a question, if I may. Okay. And folks, chime in. Let us know where you're watching from. Let us know if you're familiar with the album, what you like about it, and anything else about Alan. Um, so you mentioned the magic word before you read those off. You said how eclectic it is. That's that's an exact uh, testament and reflection of Alan as a musician. He was not a one-thing musician. He could play to pretty much any kind of music. And, and there's a lot of great stuff that does shine through in here that is either oh, wow, I never heard that side of him, or it's glimpses of stuff that came out of him and into Yes Music. There's some really neat, neat different um, ethnic layers in there. That's my comment. My question is, I got to ask, what's your favorite? My favorite is... One. You get one. I hate this question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not that difficult. Um, like Spring Song of Innocence is the one I keep coming back to because you have John singing and uh, it's also based on a, a really good William Blake poem. Um, I kind of like some of William Blake's works, uh, even took a course on him a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And I know all the words to this one. So that might be my favorite. John Kuhn as well. Yeah, uh, he but, just um, chimed in. Thanks, John. On, on in terms of like a technical, like just instrumental level, I feel like Avacac has a lot going for it, and so does Darkness parts one through three. Um, what those ones feel very, I, I guess they feel the most proggy to me, but they don't really sound much like yes to me. They kind of feel a bit like King Crimson in some aspects. That's, and how ironic is that? That's interesting. Um, I, I like those tracks and Avocac is my favorite and it has a couple twists in it. Um, and I don't mean just like time signature changes, but like that, the horn sounds come in and it's like, oh, and ooh, that works. You know, because it is more proggy and everything. Um, I, I like that album. And yeah, I, and I, I like the horns on Abacac. Yeah, I mean that 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 song. I meant I like the album, but I love that song. That's my favorite. And then um, uh, Darkness Parts One Through Three, like you said as well. And I think we like it for the same reason. Like you said, they're a little bit more proggy. Yeah, and Darkness also has like these existential lyrics at the end where it's like, how, why did the darkness turn my apartment into night or something like that? And it's just so, like everyone's, well, I, I don't wanna say everyone, but many people have been in that place, you know? Yeah. Where it's just like kind of a place of loneliness. And I was kind of surprised, like some of the lyrics on this album, um, and weirdly, like Alan White doesn't have a writing credit for any of these. Yeah. But but like some of the lyrics like that are really good. Uh, there are a few places where I would say the lyrics feel really dated, um, like on Silly Woman and perhaps on Giddy as well. But uh, dated for now or for then? Like, but do you think if you heard it when it came out, that you would have thought that? Or is it dated because they're representative of that time or a short time before, and now we're well, 40 whatever years later? Well, maybe in the 70s, I wouldn't have noticed it as much, but this whole thing about, oh, silly woman, don't go do your thing, just be next to me, it sounds very, you know, it's not. Almost it like Frankie Valley or something. It doesn't feel very today or very, equal and i don't know if the song was intended to be satire or making fun of people with those attitudes it's kind of hard to tell but yeah uh, there are definitely other songs on this album i prefer i i guess is what i'm saying um but there are like 
Oh, so this is something I want to ask you. Like the first two tracks, Ooh Baby and One Way Rag, got released as the single. And do you think these were the best choice for that sort of thing? Or do you think a couple of these other tracks could have been used instead? That's a good question because to to properly answer it, I have to ask myself the same thing I asked you about the dated lyrics. I have to put myself in 1976, you know, because I think the answer might be different, might be, I'd have to think about it, but it might be different if I were to judge it based on today's music and, you know, all of that. So, and I'm looking over here at the list, folks, not, not the Gumby show. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think those two songs feel very, like, stuff you could dance to. Like, I can imagine them being in the background of that 70s show. Like, and that's interesting, that yeah. would listen to. I, I could see Sp uh, Spring Song of Innocence as a single. Mm -hmm. uh, if it came out today, that would have to be a single. Okay. I I think. And, and probably looking at the list, the biggest crossover tune to different genres and different types of radio stations. Okay. What do you think? Do you agree or <coughs> is that whack? I'm not sure if I would have chosen Spring because then maybe people would think, oh, this is going to be more like a Yes album and have John Anderson singing throughout. Like, yeah. I, I think maybe I would have gone with, I probably would have gone with Avocac and Darkness, but, but those are like my top favorites but, instrumentally. But yeah, and I don't I don't know if those would have been singles back then. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and, because of length, right. and they're they're uh, Avocac being an instrumental. Yeah, true. Avocac is seven minutes long. Yeah. Um, everybody isn't as long but it's still well like i'm not so sure about the lyrics on that one but it does have an interesting way of ending where it sounds like a train is coming in it's like Whoa, yeah what the heck was that <laughs> um and marching into a bottle i just want to say real quickly i had to like look at the credits and be sure that it wasn't steve howe playing because it was like that good like that two minute instrumental yeah um, but yeah i guess Huh. Maybe I would have gone with uh, maybe Spring and either one of the first two tracks might have made more sense. Maybe Spring as the B-side. I'm not really sure. Oh, that makes sense for back then. I could see that. Yeah. Right. Um, and there were also a few promo videos for these back in the day for yeah. Spring, Giddy, Silly Woman and i think for ooh baby as well um it was either ooh baby or one way rag but mo most of them look very muddy like the versions that are on youtube like the cleanest one that we could find is the one for spring that's on john anderson's channel and uh apparently patrick moraz has said that he has a cameo in one of these promo videos and i'm not sure where he is uh, I, I tried my best to like look this time you, again since it's so muddy it's hard to I, see. I wonder if it's in the one what's that the one is it the one where they're in like a outdoor like there's the ceiling fan in I a mean, crowd they're, of, they're all in that same room and yeah video. i um, bet he's in one of those yeah like maybe in the audience some um, yeah i think Serving looking drinks the, or something. Looking at the one for Giddy, I did notice that like 45 minutes, 45, min 45 seconds before <laughs> the end, there was uh, the camera like focuses on the face of someone who's like wearing a red hat and it looks like it could vaguely be him maybe. Oh I'm man, now I got to watch that again. percent sure. Yeah. Um, but if anyone knows, like just let us know. Yeah, chime I'm in. We're curious. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, those videos are interesting because for spring, there's like nobody except for the musicians and then the others, it's like, there are people gathered around. It's kind of like a club sort of thing. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, probably the first glimpse 
of Alan's North drums and a full North drum kit in one of the videos, which got featured heavily on the uh, that green kit on the Going for the One tour in 77 and the first Tormato tour in 78. They were green in 77, and then he had the primary colors uh, on the first in the round tour. The North drums are the ones that look like they have like a tuba bell. You know, they scoop out mm -hmm. like that. They look like Roger Dean designed them basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I guess I should uh, mention that my first time hearing any of this album was on the Yes Years video where they had a snippet of that yeah. Silly Woman video. <laughs> And even back then, I remember thinking to myself, this feels really different from like all this other Yes stuff on here. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't until... Slightly Calypso-ish, almost. Right. And it wasn't until I was in eighth grade, or maybe seventh grade, um, in the late 2000s, where I stumbled upon Song of Innocence, the video for it, and then later on listened to the rest of the songs on the album. And I was like, huh, this is different and i didn't really explore it that much back then but i've listened to it more these times and there are like really great jazz moments and even perhaps reggae moments if if it's right. considered reggae um and you know it's just the parts that i like are very you know when they're great they're like really great um uh, when you got when you first listened to this album, what was that like? Did you like get the album from the store or how'd you get exposed? My to friend it? had it. And sorry, I pulled up a folder and it popped up in front of me. I'm I'm going to where we have pictures of the album in the sleeve and stuff. I thought I had that pulled up. Um, so I, I never got it. I don't think. I don't th think I have it. Um do you remember seeing it in my collection at any no. point? Yeah, I don't think I have my friend had it. And again, I was very young. I was 13 and um, it, it just wasn't anything that I expected. Right. So I listened to it a few times. And that was kind of it for many years, to be honest with you. Yeah. So I'm going to pull up some images while you're talking about it some more and show. Um, like here's the front cover. Yeah. I, I heard in that Nightbird and Company interview that apparently the sketch of Alan was something that Brian Lane, the manager found. So I don't know like who did the sketch. That but, does sound familiar. Yeah. And on the back of the album, uh, this was something that uh, I think Paul Watson in one of the yes groups asked about was like, why is the yes logo at the very top of it? And I think the general consensus people uh, came to was that maybe it's like due to branding, like if you're Maybe not the general public wouldn't know who Alan White is. But I agree. Vaguely know who Yes are. Or maybe a Yes fan would go to it and think, oh, maybe this will sound Yes-ish type of thing. Right. I um, totally agree. And there's also a Tom Pickard poem on the back titled Valentine. It's kind of written in pen on there, so it might be kind of hard to read, but it's easy to find online. And... I like the simplicity and the spacing in this poem. If any of you like get to look at it. Um, I have it up, but it's hard to kind of uh, hard to see there. There we go. Yeah, I actually have it up as well, but I wasn't sure if we want to like read it or not. You, if you can read it, it's kind of hard for me to read. Uh, well, I mean, I have it typed out. So, oh, I, even better. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just copied and pasted it from somewhere else. Um, so this is Valentine by Tom Pickard. Simplicity, say sleep. Or shall we shower? Have an apple. You are as I need water. Shall I move? Do you dream? Shallow snow. Flesh, melt this. So it's kind of, it feels kind of abstract to me, but it seems like it's very, you know, in the vein of like a romantic poem. I mean, it's called Valentine, but yeah. it, it's an odd choice for, like, it's not something I would expect for like the back of an album um, for some reason. Like, there, I guess it's to show there are hints of 
that poeticness, like in Spring Song of Innocence. Um, yeah. And it looks like the poem was written in 73. I'm going to flip the image around, folks. And it looks like, as I zoom in now, see the doodle of the face? And then it, there's a 1973 right there. Yeah. Zoom in again. There we go. Kind of interesting. Yeah, and I also have pulled up, um, I found this on Forgotten Yesterdays. There's this advertisement for this album where at the top it says the original white tornado and it's in black and white, um, looks kind of like a sketch, but it's probably like a photo that's been like rotoscoped or whatever the technique is. And uh, the text says, today they call him Yes's white tornado. Before today, he could be heard drumming up a storm behind Alan Price, John Lennon, and the Plastic Ono Band, George Harrison, Joe Cocker, and even Ginger Baker as That's a second right. drummer in the Air Force. That's right. Duh, Ginger Baker's Air Force. Yeah. Now Alan White brings his powerful um, drive center stage on his first solo album, Ramshackled. It's rock, it's jazz, it's R&B. And yeah, that description of the genres, I think, summarizes it pretty well. It does feel very R&B and jazz and rock. So yeah. I guess that was their attempt at saying that this isn't a Yes album. It's something very yeah. different. Yeah. Um, and one thing that I thought was kind of odd, um, which I kind of know the answer to, is that... You know, Chris Squire and Alan White, as tight as they were, they weren't on each other's solo albums in this period. Um, and like listening to that interview I mentioned earlier, uh, Nightbird and Company, it seemed like Alan was saying that the band were thinking it would be kind of silly if there were too many band members working together and they had to like find their individual voices type of thing, which I guess makes sense. I just found it kind of funny because we're so used to how close Chris and Alan are. Right. No, um, I agree with that. And uh, maybe they just needed a break from each other. <laughs> In a good way, I mean, you know. <laughs> maybe. Um, and since John guests on the song, I think this might be the only one of these first solo albums since drawing yes that he guests on and it made me wonder like do you think john could have guessed it on any of these other solo albums either on lead for a song or backing vocals for a song i don't imagine doing backing vocals would be a thing definitely not chris's because chris is just such a great singer and with steve howe steve howe has such a interesting unique voice um you know he's a tenor and it definitely goes with his album you know um mm. so i don't know i'm trying to think like who else and what else got put out he did a good job on his own solo album yeah, <laughs> yeah so i, I don't know thinking... what do you think do you hear him on a particular song I was thinking maybe backing vocals on the Steve Howe song, Australia. Like for some reason oh. I can imagine that. Interesting. Um, yeah. Maybe backing vocals on hold out your hand, you by my side, kind of like what they did live. Yeah. Um, but again, I don't know if he would have been like down for that or what, but as far as the live performances, it looks like, one Way Rag got played live by Yes uh, four times in 1976, and Spring Song of Innocence got performed 10 times. And I also saw that back in 2014 at Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. Uh, there's this video of One Way Rag being performed, and there's a drummer, I'm not sure, I didn't get a good look at who does it, but Alan White is the on the hand drum in that video, it seems. Yeah. Um, so there, there's like a, a little bit of live play for this album, but not a whole lot. Um, yeah. So I guess that brings us to how might working with Yes have influenced Alan on Ramshackled? I think the 
the fact that yes has so many influences and and different colors and shades of music that I think in probably in his mind and his heart that gave him the green light to do that on one album to have all these different you know styles and not just be exclusive to one thing you know right because he said he could be like different moods and not just be one thing so i get yeah working with yes might have you know as great as it was maybe he wanted to like have a chance to experiment with like these other things um, right like even if not just even if not writing wise like at least performance wise and just hanging out with these older friends he hadn't performed with in a while yeah let, let's play this video for them is that okay if we move to that? Or do you still have more on the album you want to cover? The tribute. Uh, oh, yeah, let me just look at this real quick. Um, well, one more question before we get into that video. Yeah. How yes is it, in your opinion? Not much at all. <laughs> Even though John and Steve have a presence, I it's just not. And yeah. I think that's great. Yeah, it's definitely the least yes sounding and the least solo sounding. I agree. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead with that tribute video. Um, I'm so, not sure if you want to preface it. but Yeah, I will. Ahead. This is something we put together. Um, and it's a slideshow of different pictures of Alan through the years. There's a reoccurring photo that's right there. That's me with Alan. Alan was 42. I was 27, 28, 27. And in my arms is Steve's older brother. And Alex was two weeks old. So you'll see Alex in that photo with some captions and see if you could put that puzzle together. But more importantly, chime in if you could tell us exactly what the recording is for the soundtrack. Who is it? This will be interesting. <laughs> Here we go. Check this out, folks. Oh, start from the beginning. There you go. Tell us if you know exactly what that recording is and who the people are playing it. And we're not going to give it away if no one guesses while we're live. We'll wait and see if people guess from the archive, and then we'll we'll say who's right or 
tell you what it is if no one is. So, <sighs> ramshackled, there you go. That's our thoughts on it, our review. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, Alan White, gone, but definitely not forgotten. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure, like, how to segue. Yeah, but... just, I guess... <clears throat> make that hard turn yeah um i do see a comment from wayne sims who says hello again dan and hello to your son yes i'm still awake and it's 3 12 a.m here in the uk <laughs> nice. um oh so i guess i would have been half an hour ago my bad <laughs> oops <laughs> uh, it says i'm just saying a quick hello before i go to bed and Aww. i'll watch the rest later today which i've saved so i'll say good night and i'll watch the rest later today oh uh, that's so great thanks uh when was on the tribute I did earlier on Drum Talk TV, uh, he's in the UK. Saying, what time is it there? It's like midnight here. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we're, we're going to close this out by touching upon uh, the set list that Yes did for their warm up show yesterday at the Travistock Wharf over in the UK. So they're and they're, and they're dedicating spoilers. the tour to Alan. I'm not sure how they're doing that other than. This is for Alan. I'm real curious. But yeah, uh, this is cool that they did this warm-up show. Let's have that set list. Right. Because uh, I'm not sure if you peeked at this. I did or, or if this... Oh, so these will be your live reactions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I learned about this uh, secondhand or maybe thirdhand. I know that Simon Barrow uh, over on Twitter shared uh, what it was. Um, he says he's going to watch some shows of theirs in Scotland and do a tour diary that he might publish. So nice. Uh, that could be interesting. And Dave Watkinson's going to see at least three shows. Yeah. Um, so I have to stress that I was told that uh, this first song on the set list is a slightly abridged version. And I'm not sure like in what way it's abridged or how slightly. 5% for nothing abridged. <laughs> No. Um, and again, folks, spoilers for the set list. Yeah. Yeah. If you, cause, and we don't know how much of the tour set list is going to be this, but of course it's going to be. So if you don't want to know, you'll want to be surprised. But after they do the first show, the videos and shit are out there anyways. But yeah. if you're going to the first show, maybe. But yeah, it's nice of you that you did do the disclaimer. That's the right thing to do. Yeah. Okay. So... The first song was a slightly abridged performance of On the Silent Wings of Freedom. Oh, wow. Wow. I wonder why they did an abridged version, though. It's not like yeah, it's but, a 20-minute song. Yeah, but it's what's funny is I'm pretty sure you and I were... I think one of us might have mentioned... Um, on a previous episode that this would be like a good song to start with as like a tribute. Th that's how I started his memorial tribute on May 29th with on the silent wings. Oh, of that's Freedom. right. Yeah. Yeah. And then I did sound chaser. Great way to warm up with two easy songs. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it is perfect, but I wonder why they did an abridged version Am my, my, I'm trying to stop my mind from figuring out well, what part did they cut out it just okay. yeah like i i have to see the video of this to really have oh there's video it. no there isn't not yet oh. um but i'm saying when there is video ah, like ah. yeah um but moving on after that we i just get... want to say one thing about yeah. that May, maybe it's a bridge because they've only been rehearsing a few days maybe they felt they need to get it down better before they play the whole thing and maybe they will be playing the whole thing yeah, maybe. I know the tour like actually starts like tomorrow in Glasgow, um, like the first like official show, I guess. Okay. Uh, so after that is yours is no disgrace. So you know something they're very familiar with, have played many times, and then this next one they actually played it on the Royal Affair tour, but it's not something they've played a whole lot other than that. No opportunity necessary, no experience needed. Oh, wow. Yeah, and then after that is, does it really happen? Again, something they've become somewhat familiar with over the last several years. Wow, that's awesome. 
And then Steve Howd uh, did his solo spot, so did a little bit of improv before going into clap. And then after that is Wondrous Stories. Oh! So, yeah, so, you know, a safe one there. And then I'm not sure. So I've seen a couple different places say, um, like one place saw that Heart of the Sunrise is between these next two songs. Another one says it's after these two. Um, but yeah, Heart of the Sunrise is in there. But these two songs are from the quest. Oh! And, yeah, and they're the only quest songs on this set list. Um, I wasn't sure if you want to take a guess or if I should just like read them off. Go, um, the Ice Bridge has to be. Yeah, that's one of them. Okay, and the other one, what, I don't know, what's the other one? Dare to Know. Of course, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the first two tracks on the album. Yeah, um, that's good. Yeah, it, it's good that there's something. I just kind of wish that there had been a couple more tracks, but may, maybe they could change their mind as they keep touring. Yeah. Um, and so after those and Heart of the Sunrise, we got the whole cl Close to the Edge album in album order. So Close to the Edge, And You and I, Siberian Cut True. And then uh, for the end, they got Roundabout and Starship Trooper. That's kind of a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and um over on louder sound someone put um their review of this warm-up show it, it sounds like there were maybe a few glitches you know they were working out the kinks but overall it sounded like it was done pretty well and the space was too cramped for there to be room for like roger dean's video wall but i think there was like an exhibition upstairs at the venue or something mm. but yeah, it should be interesting to see what the video wall stuff looks like. But yeah. overall, what do you think of that set list? I'm a little surprised that it doesn't include more classic yes lineup. Being, you know, Alan, Steve, Alan, Steve, Rick, Chris, John, hmm. that lineup. Um, but it's eclectic for sure. Um, yeah. It spans, you know, you got on the Silent Wings of Freedom from Tormato, does it really happen from uh, drama? And then you got some really early stuff. Uh, the one song off Fragile with Roundabout. And then... Well, also Heart of the Sunrise. Yeah, Heart of the Sunrise, that's right. And I guess given that they're featuring the whole album Close to the Edge, there's only so much room left, so they took almost a little bit of everything sort of here's a question to you about that and everybody else okay should they be honoring the trevor rabin years should they play like at least one or two songs from that i mean that's huge for them as a band mm -hmm. as the yes legacy and you know i love steve howe he's like one of my three very favorite guitar players way 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 at the top if not my very favorite guitar player. And just because he's the guitar player doesn't mean they shouldn't be playing something off. I And I know it'd be so easy to just say, oh, just throw in <laughs> Owner of a Lonely Heart. But how cool would it be for them to play Changes or something? They got Billy to do the other vocals and yeah. or Hearts, you know, I guess they've done that. Um, but I just think they should honor that period. If you're if you're going to do bullet points of 50 plus years, that's a big bullet point missing, even though it was only three yeah. albums. And yeah, Rick so Wakeman says, if it wasn't for 90125, Yes Might have just never gone on after that. Yeah, so a couple points toward that. Um, in Steve Howe's autobiography, he did mention that some of them feel like they don't have they don't feel ownership to some of those like Rabin era things so um i guess maybe if chris were still around there would be a little bit more and i know but, alan was also part of that but like you know but uh to answer the other part of your question i do think it would be nice if they played at least a couple tracks from the Raven years because like if anything like pick stuff that would honor Alan you know 
the stuff that features a lot of drums like changes you know changes or a really deep cut like our song um, oh yeah could even um do i'm running to honor chris as well with that gnarly bass stuff endless dream if they want to lose their minds yeah endless dream would be amazing but that's like, pretty that's a heavy song that's a difficult song no matter how you slice it it's a difficult song yeah it is i'm sure state of play might be kind of challenging as well but it'd be cool to hear yeah i don't think they ever played that live Right. Uh, I think in an interview, Alan thought they played it once, but I haven't seen anything to like any evidence of that. So I don't know if maybe it was remembering a rehearsal or what, but yeah, yeah I, I do wish, like, I'm glad there wasn't as much classic yes as maybe you were expecting, but I still would have dialed it back a little bit more like as much as i love heart of the sunrise and wonder stories and yours is no disgrace i would have swapped those out for a few more songs from the quest because you know that's their most yeah. recent album and they should feature more of it i i would trade at least one of those for a, another quest song when you put out an album you got to represent it yeah. on tour especially if you want to sell more it's the yeah. best advertising. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't just think that's weird. Yeah. So I guess our reactions are that it's not as safe as we thought it might be, but still somewhat safe in some places. But now, here's a question I would love to know, and I'm sure they're still, de- well, I'm guessing they're still determining this. Wouldn't you love to know what two or three of the switch out songs are? Like every few nights, you say, ah, let's swap. What are the swap songs that are sitting off to the side on the bench? Mm, yeah, that's a good point. They could do that, and they have done that. Like Sure, time, most time bands again. do. Most bands have one to three change out songs. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Ritual. <laughs> Ritual. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's a very, you know, I think of Alan when hearing that song, definitely. Oh, yeah. yeah. Just look, earlier I was watching um, a couple live versions from the Symphonic Tour and the 35th Anniversary Tour, um, like in Radio City Hall and Madison Square Garden, and they're pretty good for audience shot videos, like showing the energy of it. And Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess we'll have to see if anything changes. I'm sure Forgotten Yesterdays will be updated on this and we'll see some YouTube clips perhaps. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we got that to look forward to. And I know Rick is like, um, Rick Wakeman announced the dates for like his UK Christmas tour, uh, Grumpy Old Christmas Stocking tour so there's a lot to look forward to um, yeah I, I, i'm glad he's busy after all the sort of losses that you know he talked about how we even lost like tv presenter bob hall and uh dave smith the father of midi and i'm not as familiar with them but they meant uh quite a deal to him but I'm and the gentleman still... and the gentleman last year who chris got the triple neck from oh uh, yeah he passed Richard. away rick's bass player yeah, so, uh, you know, it's a lot to take in, but I'm glad that he's still keeping busy and that these yeah. other guys are keeping busy as well, you know, keeping the yes flame alive. And yeah, there's so much still to talk about. Um, yeah. And I guess with that, uh, unless you have anything else to say, I guess we can wind down. No, I, there's so much to say, but I'm also, kind of lost for words you know i'm still processing that he's gone yeah it's and and i want i feel so bad for Gigi and the kids and yeah. and their kids um and i i haven't reached out to her yet because i don't want it to get lost in the avalanche of everyone reaching out yeah i mean there's been a lot i'm sure but yeah lots of nice tributes and touching messages as well so i'm glad that people are honoring alan and that yes are as well and 
It's just, um, you, you know, like the other day I saw this John Anderson interview, like very recent where he was thinking back to fun times with Frank Ellis and Alan and sort of like laughing at some fun memories about them. So it's nice yeah. that we have the memories of these people. Yeah. So we'll close by turning up the volume on Song of Innocence from Memphis uh, in 1976. This might be the most yes-ish song of all of them, by the way. Thanks everybody for following what we do. You can see more episodes in the videos album of our Facebook page at facebook.com slash yes shift. And if you're into podcast culture, listening to us while you're jogging, running, working out, doing chores, pretending like you're working in your cubicle or whatever, you can go to anchor.fm slash yes shift. And um, Steve and I still have a lot of ideas for shows but we welcome ideas from you. How can they write us, Steve? Yeah, they can email us at yesshiftpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can message us some ideas and you can also find the videos on the YouTube channel as well, which is slowly growing. And um, yeah, we'll be back on Facebook Live, I believe next Tuesday, the 21st at 7 p.m. Pacific. Yes. Um, if anything changes, we'll let you all know on our Facebook page. Um, maybe it'll be the Oliver Wakeman box set review, or maybe it'll be something else. We'll see. But, but I know for sure on the 28th, which is Patrick Mraz's birthday, we'll do Story of I, so continuing this solo album series. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, everybody, so much. And we'll see you soon. <laughs>